the Ramayan is one of the greatest texts of ancient literature and it has a complete knowledge of life in it. So much so that at one point Maharishi suggested that the entire education for a person from kindergarten to PhD could be taught with just this one book, the Ramayan. Now, the, the Ramayan is one of two texts of Vedic literature which are called Itihas, and these are both epics. And Maharshi summarized this entire branch of Vedic literature, Itihas, with the words blossoming of totality. And I think when we say something is epic, we, we mean this sense that it represents the blossoming of totality in it. So the Ramayan has within it the, the blossoming of totality. And what do we mean by that? The example in, or the expression in the Ramayan of what is the blossoming of totality is in the creation of Ram Raj. After the war, I hope you all know the story, I'm not going to go into this story, but after the war, Ram became king and he created in his kingdom what's called Ram Raj. And I'm going to read a description of it from uh, Tulsidas's version of the Ramayan. He said, in the whole of Ram's realm, there was no one who suffered from bodily pains, ill fortune, or evil circumstances. Every man loved his neighbor and, contented with the state of life to which he had been born, conformed to sound morality and the teaching of scripture. There was no sickness and no premature death. Everyone was trim and sound of body. No one was in poverty, in sorrow, or in distress. No one was ignorant or unlucky. All men and women were naturally good and pious, clever and intelligent. Everyone appreciated the merits of his neighbor and was himself learned and wise. The air was cool, fragrant, and splendidly mild. Bees laden with honey made a pleasant humming. Creepers and trees yielded their sweetness on being asked. The earth was ever clothed with crops. The sea remained within its bounds, casting forth pearls on its shore for men to gather. The ponds were thick with lotuses, and every quarter of the world was supremely happy. The moon flooded the earth with her radiance. The sun gave as much heat as was necessary. The clouds poured forth showers for the mere asking. In the days when Ram was king. So the question comes, what, how did Ram do this? What did he know? How was it possible for him to create this utopia? This is a question we naturally would like to ask because this sounds really great. Can we do this? Let's do it. But what did he do actually? And action, we understand, is based on knowledge. And Maharishi said one time, whatever we teach a man, that is what he knows. So, what was Ram taught? Well, it happens that we know who his teacher was. His teacher was the holy sage Vasishta. And Vasishta was a totally enlightened, brilliant, sage of ancient times, probably the most eminent teacher of ancient times, with complete knowledge of all the sciences and arts, completely knowledgeable and wise. And I'm going to read a few sentences from an Upa Purana called Vasishta Langyam that describes Vasishta at one point in his life. Having performed great austerity, virtuous, possessed of inner fulfillment, 
his senses fully under control, divine, a thousand years old, living on air as his only sustenance, the constant companion of Agni through his long meditations, having cleared away all stresses and become pure by the repetition of mantras, he wished only for pure knowledge as a reward for his tapas. So this was Ram's teacher, the best teacher that could be found in the kingdom for the heir to the throne and the best teacher of ancient times. Great, great teacher. The Yoga Vasishta is the chronicle of what Vasishta taught Ram. And this is why the Yoga Vasishta was written. This is why it's important, because we want to know what Vasishta taught Ram so that he was able to create Ram Raj, to create that level of perfection that we described, where everyone was supremely happy and pleased with everyone else and the world was at peace. How did he do that? What did he learn from Vasishta? So the essence of the Yoga Vasishta is contained in a group of seven chapters, and it's the story of King Shikhid Twaja and his wife Churdala. And this group of seven chapters is also known as the Yogasara Upapurana. So it's the pith, it's the, the core of the Yoga Vasishta. Yoga Vasishta is a long book containing 30,000 verses and countless stories. It's a wonderful, wonderful trove, treasure of ancient knowledge of life. In these seven chapters, the story of Shikhidvaja and, and Trudala, there's two main themes. One is the full potential of man, seven states of consciousness. It goes into that. The second theme is technologies for creating an ideal utopian society on earth. Ha, ah, that's what we're looking for. And this is a summary of the chapters. And you might notice chapters four, five, six, and seven look very interesting. <laughs> okay. The core teaching of this group of seven chapters comes out in response to a very clever, piercing question by Brahm. Now, the whole Yoga Vasishta is set up as a dialogue between Vasishta and Ram. So, Vasishta tells a story. And maybe at some point, Ram says, wait a minute, what do you mean by this? And I can tell you that when Vasishta started talking about Queen Shurdala flying, Ram wanted to know, what's this flying thing? <laughs> <laughs> but the really piercing question was that after he'd understood that the Vedic masters are focusing, focusing on creating enlightenment, in the people, in their audience, higher states of consciousness. So, why do the masters of the Vedic tradition teach yogic flying? This was a very interesting question. And it wasn't a question that Vasishta could answer in one sentence. And we're going to go broadly, quickly, over the, the details of that answer. For that, we need to understand what collective consciousness of society is. Now, this is how Vasishta describes it in the Yoga Vasishta. The ignorance or clarity of vision that characterizes the individual members of society determines the level of the collective consciousness of the whole society. The atmosphere is created by the collection of individuals. The degree of purity of heart and mind, the level of consciousness of the individual measured by the degree to which perception is right, and thinking is in accordance with natural law, or the lack of purity, the extent to which the individual fails to perceive the reality, and thinking violates natural law. In precise measure, every individual consciousness contributes to the collective consciousness or atmosphere of the society. So he's giving this idea that there's a collective consciousness of society. Now, what can we do about that? Collective consciousness is a field. Everyone contributes their consciousness to the field and is connected to everyone else through the field. 
This is the level where we are all one together. Vasishta knew that, and we all know that Maharshi knew this also. At the point of transcending, at the level of the unified field of all laws of nature, the individual meditator practicing TM stirs and nourishes the entire collective consciousness. And we call this a field effect of consciousness. So on the right side of this slide, you see the surface value of thinking and then deeper and deeper levels of think thinking. And at the bottom of this triangle, the consciousness reaches transcendental consciousness, the unified field of all the laws of nature, where the consciousness is completely integrated, united. So the field effects of consciousness, where individuals influence the whole collective consciousness, are only possible by taking the attention to the level of the unified field. That means if you have some technique or some process of concentration or contemplation that doesn't take your mind to the depth, you may have some good advantage from that, there may be some deep insights that come or whatever, but you're not stirring that field of transcendental consciousness, you're not having an effect, a nourishing effect on the whole collective consciousness of society. That requires transcending, that requires this, this technique, this process that Maharshi had and which evidently Vasishta also had access to. The direct experience of the unified field in the process of transcending takes in the total brain. Total brain functioning is only possible through transcendental meditation. Maharshi makes this point in one of his lectures. Only the practice of transcendental meditation gives rise to this total brain functioning. And the reason is that across the cortex, every little thing you can think of is a point on the cortex. So if you're thinking of something, if you're doing something, if there's any kind of mental activity, it involves something on the cortex, and it doesn't spread to the whole brain. Now, there's a story I like to tell about one of my heroes, and this is Dr. Lyubimov. And Dr. Lyubimov was a brain scientist at the... Uh, EEG Institute in Moscow. And at one point, he somehow got a few meditators into his laboratory and was, he was taking their EEG. And the EEG, you may have seen EEG, it does a raw tracing and then you have computers that calculate what's actually happening. He was looking at the raw tracing of the EEG coming from these meditators. And he said, what these people are doing, everyone in the world should be doing. Mm -hmm. And he started Transcendental Meditation, he started the cities, learned yogic flying, and he became the national leader of the TM movement in Russia. And one of the results that, one of the results that came out from his research was the discovery that as Coherence spreads across the brain. It enlivens the hidden brain reserves. This was Lubomov's phrase for what happens. So the hidden brain reserves are brought out when the coherence stretches, spreads across the brain from a single point and takes in more and more of the whole brain. This is a side discussion of EEG and Dr. Lubomov and his tremendous perception of how EEG works. So here are some calculated um, pictures of coherence in the brain. The one on the left is showing that coherence starts in the very first meditation. Somebody was, was taught TM and they were hooked up to the EEG for the very first meditation. They got good results. Advanced meditators have much more coherence this is how coherence grows through the practice. So the practice is effortless. It doesn't gain its effect through long, diligent practice and hard work. The effect comes effortlessly and easily from the very start. And the benefits collect and gather over time and grow that way. So the conclusion 
briefly, coherence and order in society is not created by coercion of police or military or by eliminating differences on the surface of life, for example, by eliminating different parties or different political systems, eliminating different races or different religions. Coherence in collective consciousness means that every individual simultaneously supports his own evolution and enrichment and supports and enriches the whole society with every action simultaneously enriches both of those areas. This requires enlivening the basis of life, the level where we're all one, the unified field of all the laws of nature. So in the early 60s, Maharshi, aware of these field effects of consciousness, predicted that 1% of the population practicing TM would have effect on the whole population. And this was verified in 1974. I was there in the lecture hall when Garland Landreth announced it to Maharshi. And Maharshi immediately realized that if this was really true, then he could go beyond just teaching individuals, individuals. He could think in terms of teaching the whole society, creating coherence in the whole population. So this is the 1% cities first, first study. I'm sure you've all seen this. And then Vasishta says, in this way, the radiance of life-supporting influence of 5% of the whole world's population experiencing transcendental consciousness through the practice of TM is enough to establish a utopian society for the whole world. 5%. Wait a minute, Marshy only talked about 1%. But in 1974, in Fairfield, he explained that 5% was a second step. The first step is changing the trends of time with 1%. Crime rate starts to go down, things start to get better. But you, if you can get 5%, then you can create this utopian society. And people hadn't heard that, but it was a public news, news conference where he brought that out. So I posted that on my website. It's still there. You can check on it if you want to see more. She's saying 5%. Now the thing is, and in this answer, this fairly long answer of Vasishta to the question about why yogic flying, Vasishta points out the challenge of teaching 5% and sustaining that number over time. Concerning the portion of the population that devotes themselves to regular practice, that group may fluctuate, fluctuate in size from day to day and year to year due to the absence of needed support and nourishment for the practice. The ability of 5% of individuals in society to continue in the practice of creating an ideal society may vary since the individuals whose participation is creating the effect may be beset with challenges. And it's, it's a huge number of people, 5% of the population of India I think it's something like 70 million. So teaching that many people and keeping them taught and keeping them meditate, meditating, it's a huge project. Huge, really huge. So Vasishta was good at math. <laughs> he knew he couldn't reach that many people. So yogic flying in groups creates a powerful influence of coherence for the whole population equal to the square of the number of flyers. And that means for a population of India, you need something like, I think it was 3,700 flyers together in one place. 3,700, it's not unmanageable. That kind of um, challenge is often taken up by corporations that they need to train 3,700 people to do this, that, or the other thing. So it's not, a, not such a big deal. It's doable. So this is why the masters of the Vedic tradition teach yogic flying. In any generation, they, they can create coherence and collective consciousness and nourish the whole society, reducing crime, accidents, sickness, tragedies of war, and even natural disasters with just a small number of siddhas practicing yogic flying together in a group. So... This is the, the principle, the reason why the Vedic tradition of masters and the Vedic tradition 
has this responsibility. As for example, the Shankaracharyas, each Shankaracharya of India, there's four main, main months, they have responsibility for the spiritual development and of growth and growth of all the people in their area. They have that parental role. That's what they do. They try to think, what can we do for these people to raise the level of collective consciousness, reduce the suffering, reduce all the, the improper things that are going on. That's their, that's their role in life, is to uplift society. So here's a technique, here's a technology. Now we're going to go through, we had on one side, on one pole, the Ram Raj, and the technologies that Ram used to create Ram Raj. Now we're going to look at modern times, modern technologies, yogic flying, intervention in Cambodia. This is a story that's in the, liter in the literature, in the journal of Maharishi Vedic Research Institute. So they, the teachers of TM in Australia and New Zealand were given the project by Maharshi of uplifting the, the level of life in Cambodia. Cambodia was deeply stressed by the Vietnam War and wars that came after that. And there was so much PTSD in the population. They, this was the poorest, literally, the poorest country in the world. So what to do? Get government support for establishment of a university. Acquire land. Build facilities, classrooms, and dormitories. Gather faculty to teach. Advertise classes for potential students in the region. Here's the library that they built. They really did this. This is step by step. So then the final steps. 5,000 students applied to, to be at the university. And they accepted 500 students because that's the facility they bought, they built. The students arrive, they teach all the students TM, they teach them yogic flying, and they make yogic flying part of the curriculum. And now the army, the change makers who will transform Cambodia, is ready. And here they are, the force for peace and prosperity in Cambodia. These are a bunch of kids sitting on foam, okay? <laughs> So what they did, first thing they did is they put an end to civil war. Now they did some look over countries in the world who during the years 1990 to 1998 sought to change their political system to democracy. And then you ask, did democracy help? Did it create peace? And before the elections, there were 59 countries at peace and 12 countries at war. After the elections, 36 countries at peace and 35 countries at war. This doesn't look like a good technique. Now, only three countries had civil war at the start, before elections, and then peace afterwards. Those three countries who enjoyed peace after democratic elections were Cambodia, Mozambique, and Namibia. All of them had groups of yogic flyers. So then, there's a need to create a healthy, thriving economy. Cambodia needed it more than anyone. And the left-hand chart shows Cambodia's annual per capita GDP growth rate, showing a rather dramatic fall in 2008, but we, that happened around the world. We don't mind that. And then, on the right-hand side, this shows that their currency after about 1994, was very stable, inflation was very small. And this is a very important part of a healthy, thriving economy. And then particip participating in the global economy, the left-hand chart shows annual apparel manufacturing revenue. It's going up and up with a dip in 2008 again. And then on the right-hand chart, it shows the uh, millions. Is it right? number of foreign, visit, foreign visitors in Cambodia. I think that's in millions. millions. Yeah, in millions, between 1995 and 2000. So that shows people are going there, spending money. This is really good for their economy. And then spreading the wealth to all the people in the society. 
So the percentage of undernourished people fell, the percentage of the population living in poverty fell from 45% to 21%. The percentage of people who had access to proper sanitation grew from 3% to 30%. Those who had access to clean water went from 25% to 60%. Food poverty declined significantly. There were dramatic decreases in infant mortality and young child mortality and maternal mortality and great, great increases, doubling and more in primary school and secondary school and in government budget for education. So the poorest country in the world in 1990, but out of 152 countries in 2010, number 63. This was really great. And who did that? These kids. So students can change the world. Maharshi calls it invincibility through student age. So why the masters of the Vedic tradition of masters taught yogic flying? It is a direct path to fulfillment of their parent role, parental role for the whole society. And this is why they did it, we assume, in the days of Ram Raj. This is how Ram Raj must have been done because we see that Ram knew that. And this is how we can do it now. So the conclusion is that the perfection of life in Ram Raj is attainable in our generation by making use of the Maharshi effect and the extended Maharshi effect to create coherence in world consciousness. Every responsible leader in society, every head of a family, every person who has re responsibility or care for the people around him should read this book, Yogic Flying According to Yoga Vasish. Thank you. <laughs>